Hello, welcome once again to Whispers in the Theatre. I'm your host, the Whispering Gardener Shu, here to continue our exciting tale, The Other Side of Myth, Chapter 17, Theatrical Break. Vanessa stood in the shadow of a tree, weeping into her hands. Her chest felt heavy yet tight, each breath demanding more energy. She wanted to keep her sorrow muted, but the sting of it hurt too much. It was more than she could suffer. Her magic told her Todd wasn't the only one to die. Cammy was gone, too, and while Otis moved through rifts in search of their reunion, she wanted to stay hidden for good. It was her fault. If the three hadn't met her, they would have never come down this path. Death was all that awaited an elf killer. Either you were it, or it came for you. If it had taken her instead, it might be fine. But two people she loved paid the price. Two more people. And it could have been avoided if she didn't come to a group of retrievers with a childish request. Can you help me retrieve a reason to live? She laughed something bitter at herself and dug her hands into her shoulders. They succeeded but she never considered how easy it'd be to lose again. She felt the cold hand of her instructor on the back of her neck. She heard a harsh whisper and gritted her teeth. You weak girl. You think elves will pity you. You think they'll hesitate when they find out what you are. There's no going back. We'll let you walk out that door, because we know you'll find out. Vanessa slid down the tree. Maybe she'd go back after all these years. Maybe it'd be better to die in a different foreign land. Vanessa! Otis cried out as he spotted her at last. He ran over, pulling her into a hug. His warmth melted the touch of her instructor away, but her fate was cold stone, and it weighed him down. She pushed him back and hissed, Just leave me. Why would I ever do that? Why would I leave the one loved person I have left? His voice cracked. Otis was a performer, but the truth was coming through. Because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. You did not bring this job to us. Cammy did, but Otis wouldn't fault her either. You did not put us in this dangerous profession. He did, and somehow thought he'd never regret it. This was supposed to be the last job, too. He reached out to Vanessa, and she studied his hand. I don't know what to do anymore. She murmured. He smiled. Now why would you trouble yourself with the thought? I'm the one who comes up with the plans, right? And he would again. Cammy told him to live, and even if it was just with Vanessa, he was determined to do it. He just needed to figure out his next move. Maybe he needed a break. No, maybe he needed something to ease his heart. Revenge. A voice came from the darkness behind him. He turned sharply as Vanessa's eyes widened and spotted a figure pushing through the brush. A pale and lanky thing emerged, standing tall in a sleeveless brown robe. 
One large eye looked down from a bald head as it extended his hand. Why live with the pain inside you? Why suffer any more than this one moment? Why not give your heart the thing you want the most? It was an offer. Somehow this thing would help and all it needed was for them to take his hand. Otis swallowed, suddenly thirsty with a glass of water in front of him. Vanessa did too, entirely exhausted but witnessing the prospect of restful nights. Their hands moved in tandem, and they might have shaken if another figure didn't roll out of the bushes. A jack-o'-lantern head rose on a diminutive body wearing a leaf cloak. Branch hands straightened his head as it looked from them to the lanky stranger. His green light gaze gave them a few other looks before it turned its head to the sky. Mom, over here! It wailed with a child voice. Coming out from the brush astride a beast of wood and weeds, a woman rode with her feet hanging on one side. Her skin was brown like almonds, and her hair was long, pink, and tossed to one side. Her eyes were green but lacked the light of the pumpkin's glow. His mother had constructed it, and her short pointed ears made Vanessa cautious. A half-elf suddenly emerged, and all she could see was how much she didn't want to be here. She still didn't want elf blood on her hands, and could not prepare herself for another enemy. You're a slippery one. The woman turned to the strange merchant. I have been riding all over looking for you. It is the middle of the night, in the middle of the woods, and yet you still manage to find some people to bother. She scalded, and her pumpkin child pointed accusing fingers. She looked down at it and frowned. And you? Me? Stop calling me mom. Say it with me. Melia. Me. Me. me Meom. The half-elf sighed. I don't know why I tried. What is going on? Otis barked. You two have had the luck of being saved from a mannequin by a member of Thomas Wilder's squad. She produced an ID. In the night it glowed, showing her name, age, and an emblem of the Magic Brigade. This woman was in her early twenties. They didn't know about Thomas Wilder or how they were saved. Revenge still wet their appetite. Tell them what I am. Let their heart decide what fate they best pursue. You be quiet, she barked at it. You two are injured. I can assume you lost someone moments ago. This thing is a mannequin, and I bet it dashed you the moment it felt your grief. I'll be honest, it can give you the power to get revenge, but that will consume you. It'll be all you think about. Are you sure you want it? Otis looked into Vanessa's eyes. Her gaze was fierce. The touch of revenge was as palpable as her familiar hand on his cheek. The euphoria of taking a life might sate the agony in their chest. Revenge made their hearts thunder like drums, and as they took each other's hand they knew how much they needed it. They turned not to Melia, but the mannequin in his proffered hand. Can we bet? The pumpkin looked at her. She turned his head forward. Let's just watch them decide. They reached for the hand, but stopped as they spotted their rift ticket marks. Cammy and Todd would never rest in peace if they followed this pursuit. Revenge had called before but they never answered. 
How far would they go if they sought it now? Back to the scarlet-eyed girl and the elf? Back to the academy for elf killers? Back to the playhouse where Otis first met the other two? How far would they go before they answered the last request of their lost beloved? Live. When would they get the chance? Vanessa pulled their arms down and the mannequin seethed. Once more you deny the heart. His head snapped to the half-elf. She shrugged, pressing the brooch on her right side. Thomas, I found another one north of Red Allure. I think it's the one people spotted in the area. Quano is looking for the one near Gravel House as we speak. Affirmative. You may dispose of it. Reunite with Quanu when you get the chance. Aye, aye. Melia smiled. Aye, aye. The pumpkin nodded. Vines grew out from under his cloak. Thorn tantrum. Thorns like hooks grew along them, sinking into the mannequin as it tried to run away. They tore and its pieces broke into magic fluttering off as the vines pulled back. The pumpkin smiled up to Melia, who dropped a green ball of light into his mouth. She turned to the two next. Good job turning that off for now. How about we get you some medical treatment? A cart grew out from her beast. Letting her lead them toward it, they joined the pumpkin child as she rode off into the night. Kiara did not think sleep would come easily after the sight she saw. It certainly hadn't left her mind as they reunited with the boys and headed back to the inn. She had killed intentionally, even if she didn't want it to go that far. This time she had moved the fire, and what else could have happened to that massive wooden body? Even if it was instant, she left the body there. If it wasn't for Kago, she didn't think she would ever sleep again. While she lagged behind their group in those dark thoughts, Diana whispered to him. He pulled her aside when they got back. Danson had no trouble retiring, but the boy in black sat her down at the table preparing a white petal tea as he told her a story. I was six when I took a life for the first time. He smiled, but it seemed haunted. I knew I might have to one day, but usually that was left to my mom. I was on a mission, though, and a man we were tracking was about to ship his cargo off. There were fourteen kids like me, and he had sold hundreds before us. Usually, I got the info and took it home, but if I didn't act that night, those kids would be gone forever. He met her eyes. She could almost see the blade in his hand and feel his weight in her own. I was taught to go for the neck. It was the easiest place. As quiet as the mouth, I dropped on the guy and did it, but the sight haunted me. The blaze sunk deep into the flesh, but the man did not go down. As pain and terror filled him at once, he opened his mouth to scream, and blood sputtered out. Somehow that had been what finally told him he was dead. Kago stood over this man and watched his disbelief turn into anger and then desperation. He watched him because he had to make sure he died, and when the body dropped with eyes still open, he felt like the dead was watching him. It was easy to take a life, but not easy to live with it. Kiara gulped. How did you get over it? At first, I didn't. I cried a lot, and I kept having nightmares. I still remember the one where he wasn't too shocked to strike back. In it, he attacked me but died and buried me under him. I didn't want to kill ever again, 
and my family wasn't going to make me. I remember my brother trying to teach me how to fight. He said when I was good enough, we'd go out and beat up the bad guys instead. Kago laughed, but I couldn't get over it. I still felt the blood on my hand. My mom disappeared for a bit, though, and came back with this tea. Kago poured her a cup. It calms you down and helps with accepting difficult decisions. She made sure I had a cup every night, and eventually, I didn't think about what I saw. I thought about the kids we helped. My dad even helped me get in contact with some of them to see how they were doing. Kiara turned to Piala, resting in the bed. She nodded, taking a sip. Do you still drink this to calm down? Kago shook his head. I've kind of gotten used to killing at this point. Chalk it up to training in the life I've had since then. You don't have to get used to it yourself, though. If you have to kill again, I can always make you a cup. He stood, letting out a yawn. As he headed for the door connecting their rooms, Diana stopped him with a kiss on the cheek. He flushed, but said nothing as he pushed open the door. With her tea finished, Kiara had no trouble after that. The next day continued their journey to the town to the north. It was a quarter circle on water's edge, with boats bobbing on its clear blue lake. It sloped downward as they entered, making them disembark so Arrowhead could carry the cottage away. The incline leveled as they entered the shopping arcade, where Kiara was caught in a tourist trap. Stands flaunted goods around her, flowers with sweet smells and soft colors, blunt weapons and household tools. One sold little glass figurines, and another bore a man happy to sell crystals. An urge emerged in her to buy a souvenir, only for the lack of funds to strike her suddenly. She didn't even know what the currency was and turned to the others for answers. She waved Diana over as she surveyed and whispered in her ear, What type of money do you use in this country? The same type you use everywhere else. The redhead beckoned Kago and reached into his bag. She pulled out a small sliver of paper and a few coins that clacked in her hand. This, she held up the paper, is a fin note. The color denotes how much it's worth. This one was red, with a white design on it. It gave Kiara the distinct feeling of a family crest. These are fin chips. The same principle, except the little notches decide. Five, ten, fifty. The design was on the coin, too. Diana went up to the nearest stand. Behind the figurine, a woman came to life with excitement. Words fought for freedom against the pressed-down smile, but she let the glass do the talking. Diana poured nine more notes from her pocket and threw in the chips as extra. She placed a glass bird in Kiara's hand as she turned back and watched the girl get pulled to another stand. If you're going to keep something fragile like that with you, then you'll need one of these. Piala pulled Kiara to the crystal merchant, who puffed out his chest. Actually, Kago joined them. If Kiara's going to be sticking around, I think she should get a few of them. She looked at the prices and went a little faint. She hoped these crystals were important because their hundred fin price tags certainly imply they were. Piala held a small green one up, taking it from the bow with the lowest prices. Low, but still 125 fins. Maybe that was cheaper than she thought, but she was at a fairly crisp zero. 
They're called pocket stones. Kago continued. One of that color is good for carrying small things. Not only are they good for that, this here is the newest variety of pocket stones, fresh from the minds of the forward society. The merchant spoke. After many complaints of stones being stolen, Forward designed these to recognize the aura of the people they belong to. If there's a way to empty them, it hasn't reached my ears yet. He was mesmerized by what he said, but Kago crossed his arms. As impressive as it sounded, he didn't underestimate a thief's ingenuity. Danson stroked his chin, however. The Forward Society does it again. He paid taking one of the green ones. Is there anything like pocket stones where you're from, Kiara? Did Nandoxia have anything like a personal dimension stored inside a colorful rock? Even the ideas behind inorganic teleportation couldn't compare to that. She thought her home world was pretty good, but magic could break reality. She shook her head rather than answer aloud and Diana popped up at the stand. Wait, if you're selling FS goods, then they're in this town? Her eyes lit up. The merchant nodded. Yes, in fact, if you go to the other side of the arcade, you'll see the new device they're showing off. Diana let out a squeal and took Kiara's hand. Her eyes were sparkling as she told her through the myriad of shops, forcing their group to nearly jog behind. You've got to see this. It's going to be amazing. I just know it. She said along the way and stopped when she saw the banner fluttering above a stage. Forward society was spelled out in vertical letters, the banner hanging behind a presenter. Upon the stage, there was a woman about Kiara's height with a great deal more bulk. Tawny pigtails sat on her shoulders while big eyes looked at the gathering crowd. Those eyes spoke to Kiara the most. Their blue irises were large, covering so much she could barely see the whites. Despite their size, she couldn't see pupils and was nearly confident none was there. That didn't leave the woman blind, however because as her crowd grew, the smile on her face widened. Hello, one and all. You're in for a treat. A favor was asked of the Forest Society, and we're ready to show it to the world. She turned her ear toward them and cupped it. I hear you loud and clear. Where is this treat, Astrid, and when can we see it? She tapped her foot. Well, you're already looking at it. It's a product for artists, a marvelous thing. This stage will change theaters from here to the Dragon Dens. All we need today is for someone to help us show it off. I'll do it. Diana bounced forward, and the woman pulled her up. As they talked in whispers, Kago watched and snickered. She's amazing, huh? He crossed his arms and marveled. She used to always shove Forward Society magazines in my face. She'd probably love going to your world. There was something nostalgic in his eyes. It made Kiara wonder when the boy who killed became the one in love with the girl. Diana waved down, and he waved back. Don't wave, you clown. Get up here with me. He shrugged and obliged. So long as you know I'm going to make this my stage. She scoffed. You think you can upstage me? Think. I used to always hold back for you. The smirk she gave in response made him feel like this was an arena instead. A challenge was in the air, and he'd need more than a jest to meet it. The fate of foes. Finale. Think you can do it? I'll even play the lady. His body shifted slightly and his hair grew out. Astrid grinned. We have a show, Gathering Folks. She hurried behind the stage and pulled a lever. Smoke erupted, 
and Piala came to life as it billowed to the sky. She turned to Dunson and Kiara, almost as excited as Diana a moment ago. Are those two actors? She asked, and Dunson nodded. That's what Kago used to say. This will be the first time I see it, though. He focused on the stage as smoke cleared. Where once there was a wooden platform, the audience now looked upon a lavish bedroom. A canopy bed sat center right with a familiar-looking noblewoman sitting in a bell dress. She stood and stared out the window, her back to the door. It came flying open with a crash, and a red-headed knight stumped in. A helmet was in its hand, but he dashed it to the ground as the woman filled his eyes. You betrayed me, he roared. The woman put a hand against the pane. She chanced to look over her shoulder, then looked away sharply, like someone called her name below. I warned you what I was, she said. The knight rushed over, grabbing her shoulder. You warned me and told me you changed. What was the purpose of it all? What did we spend that night together for? Was it just another job to you? Did any of it mean anything? I have never slept with a man while doing my job. I catch their heart in other ways. A touch, a soft-spoken word. It was an easy thing. But you... She let him turn her around and reach for his face. The touch came up shallow, though. Her wrist caught in his other hand. What? What lie could you possibly say now? You were something different. That fierceness in your eyes. The time we spent talking felt like nothing I felt before. There was passion in that alone, and being together made it more. I felt a fire. I felt alive. Returning to my husband was like the return of winter. Ice water and my body bare. And as pavement, as a show of your love, you send him to me. You send his fury and his ire and feed them with my men. I mean so much to you, and yet an ambush is my reward? Is this what it means to be of value to you? The noblewoman stared into his eyes. She smiled and unmasked the sorrow. Perhaps I never learned how to repay love. But you want answers, yes. You want to know? Tell me. I needed it to be over. My husband's stupid war would finally be through. This terrible chapter would be done, and you would have no obligation to your lord. And your husband would be the victor. But you would escape. I knew you would. All for a few nights together? Is that what it was really for? The knight dropped her hand and hit the wall. The noblewoman turned her eyes away, giving him the only answer he needed. I wanted a life with you, even after I found out about your husband. Perhaps that's why I fell in love. You were never enticed by the danger. You only saw me. Her eyes turned back. He matched her smile. Their lips came together and a dark spark crackled up the side of her face. She pressed a hand to it as he pulled back. It's the touch of death. I think it fits to give it to you with a kiss. Why do you have such a curse upon you? My man and I took it as an added edge. Even if your husband killed most of us and found people to take it, he would never have found enough. You shall see him again soon, but only in the afterlife. I see. She turned to the window and pushed it open. How fitting that I die like this. As my kiss curse you, your kiss returns it. Such a gentle cruelty. When your heart is warm, I am certain our daughter will have an excellent father. 
Suddenly, the knight turned. What are you saying? In willow steed she awaits. Promise that she never turns into me. The knight's hand flew out to catch her, but she cast herself from the window. As he watched her fall, the stage darkened. A heavy silence fell over the audience, and then they erupted into applause. As the stage returned to what it was before, Diana and Kago took a bow. They left it to the presenter as they rejoined the group. That was amazing! Kiara collapsed. Of course it was! Kago ran a hand through his hair. Diana threw her arm around his shoulder and kissed him on the cheek. She turned to Kiara. I mentioned that Kegel and I were with a troupe before, remember? It was an acting troupe that traveled from town to town in a big traveling cottage. The Harlequin's performers. It was mostly female, but Kegel was part of our small group of guys. Were you two on stage a lot? Diana was more than me. One wonders when Kegel even decided to take the stage. Dunson smirked. Kegel glared up. It was when I heard Diana would have her first kissing row. He murmured as he looked away. Both the elf and Kiara clutched their chests. I didn't even know that. Diana clutched hers, too. Kago's face reddened and he covered his eyes. The head actress told me that you were going to be chosen for the row. Her daughter kept complaining about how she didn't want to kiss you. Wow, why not? I'm the most dazzling person. He squinted at her as he peeked through his fingers. I don't know, but the head actress poured her energy into making me stage ready. She got it into her head that it would be a perfect chance for us both to learn, and I kind of liked the idea of sharing my first kiss with you. His voice shrank as he went on. Danson's eyes gleamed as a long smile stretched across his face. Kago glared up. But the elf stayed silent, silent in consideration. Diana chuckled. Wow, I was an oblivious kid, huh? Yeah, Kago sighed, and Kiara shared a laugh with the elf. Considering her excitement before, Kiara was surprised Piala hadn't said something too. She turned expecting to find the girl mesmerized by the performance, and yet found no one standing at her side. Her heart dropped as she turned back to the others. Where did Piala go? Murph died as their group looked around. Chapter 17 Ends And so too ends another episode of Whispers in the theater. I would be delighted if you would join me once again.